program, similar to this program. So we, we're not quite completed with that yet. It's been about five weeks. And what Valley did was we, um, we wrote up the, the grant program and um, had a software uh, agency work with us so that people could upload secure documents. And we set it out, there were 88 uh, businesses that had applied. We selected 23 of them for grants and the average grant was $5,400. And then from there, as part of our grant uh, arrangement with the city, uh, we sent those applicants to Northampton and Northampton wrote the contract, cut the checks and is doing the follow-up as far as receipts for that funding. So our proposal with um, Amherst is that we would do that complete project. So of course Amherst would cut the checks, we wouldn't do that, but, um, but we would do the follow-up work, uh, the reporting, um, and I think one of the advantages that we have is that we're familiar with the CDBG funding. So we're familiar with the documentation and uh, all the compliance issues um, and all the income verification. And for those of you who don't know, uh, the micro business grant program or the micro business uh, CDBG program, it ha is targeted to businesses that are five uh, employees or less and they're low to moderate income businesses as stated by the HUD uh, guidelines. So those two things are really critical in selecting applicants. And uh, part of what we would do as part of this grant program is to have people certify as far as uploading their tax returns, profit and loss statements, and other documentation so that we're really clear they're low to moderate income. Now the good news or the bad news is that there's a lot of need which a, a lot of businesses that weren't low to moderate income before certainly will fall into that category now. So, and I think, I think the need is pretty obvious with people whose um, businesses are shut down. Um, we talked with uh, the Chamber of Commerce the other day and we'd be working with the bid and the Chamber of Commerce to market this and make sure that it was really spread into Amherst so that the eligible businesses could be a part of it. But when we were having that discussion, um, there was a number 32% of unemployment in Amherst and surrounding areas. And last year at this time, 3%. So uh, clearly the need is there. And the, the, there's a few different regulations as far as how the money can be spent, but really there's, I have a list here of, um, you know, uh, safety equipment, all the PPP technical support so that people can sell things online, upgrading software, upgrading computers. Um, so I think, you know, it's, uh, it would really, really help small businesses. I mean, I do uh, consulting with small businesses every day and um, what they really need is grants. The loans have been great. Um, some of them are getting loans, the um, PPP and the EIDL, but really they're with, with so much uncertainty, they're afraid to use those and to, to have more debt. So we hope that this program really um, goes through and, um, you know, Valley is poised to administer that quickly. Like I said, we have experience doing that. So, um, you know, we hope that goes through. Great. Just, and thank you so much, Dee. Um, sure. Anybody from the committee have any questions for Dee about her presentation or uh, the proposal or the budget? Uh, this is Matt. I have a question. Hi, Matt. Um, yeah, I noticed that of the total request amount of 203000 the amount that is budgeted to actually go out as grants is $165,000. Um, and while the proposal noted that 
there are at least 20 to 30 businesses that might meet the eligibility. Um, I think you estimate that that 165 can cover 22. Sorry about that. Is it possible that, um, that there's even greater need than that 165,000 or how is that amount derived? So in general, I can say there's, there's, there's greater need than 165,000 for sure without doing a survey or assessing that with such a short time period, it's really hard to tell. And we, like I said, we had a conversation uh, with both John and Claudia at um, the chamber and um, tried to assess that, but really it's, it's quite difficult. You know, we, we did make a list of some of the businesses you know, that are sole proprietor or small businesses, um, you know, personal care, martial arts, technical businesses, things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm clear the needs there because I work with, I work with businesses all day long. Um, and I think Claudia and John have also seen um, a huge need. Yeah, I guess my, my question is, um isn't there much more need than 165,000? Do you, did you limit it to 165,000 for a reason or? So there's an administrative cost to that. Is that your question? Uh, no, um, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm sorry. I guess I'm not quite so, clear of your question. So very, very, very simply, why are you asking for 203,000 instead of 250,000 or $300,000? This is, can you hear, this is Joanne Campbell from Valley. Yes, we can hear you, Joanne. Are you? I would defer that to Nate because Nate, Nate suggested uh, that we, that, you know, there's a limit of $400,000 for the town and trying to figure out what the need is that certainly there's tons of need in for the social service agencies and for micro businesses. Um, and so I don't, I would defer to Nate a little bit on this. Yeah, sure, I was trying to cut in there, but Joanne said it nicely, the, um, there may be more need. I think there's, there's a few pieces. Uh, one, DHCD really wants, uh, they don't really want any money to be unspent or have this be a program where after you know, six or eight months, you're saying, well, geez, actually, we have, we have too much money. And not that, that that would be the case, but based on the average amount of funding in Northampton, um, you know, we didn't want to, estimate too much funding for this program and then either have a balance or, you know, if, for instance, we weren't sure how businesses would be able to income certify. And so, you know, depending on that, that could really restrict how a business um, is eligible. So we're still learning. DHCD actually put something in writing today, which makes it seem a lot more flexible, but typically for a business to income certify, it's pretty rigorous. And the concern would be if they kept to those rigorous standards, we may actually not have as many businesses as we'd estimate. So, you know, not knowing some of these little details um, and that there's also a, a greater need, a good need for social services. So, you know, that's kind of the committee's recommendation at this point. So if we hear from the rest of the proposals, the committee could always say, well, do we think there's a greater need for the business community than is uh, proposed right now? Or is it a good, you know, is it a good number? Um, you know, my thought is if we, you know, award $10,000, the maximum, you know, that's still 15, you know, 15, 16 businesses. So that's still a fair number. You know, if there's a range, then maybe there's 30 businesses that could be supported through this program. That, that's a good number as well. So I think, I think 165 is, you know, it's fair, you know, sure there's more need. It's hard to say right now how many businesses would actually be income eligible and qualify based on DHCD standards. Like Dee said, there's kind of two pieces, the number of employees and then income eligibility. Yeah. That's, that yeah, very, yeah, very, yeah, very helpful. And second question, if I may, um, whether this is to Joanne or Dee, I'm not sure, but um, um, I know that the Downtown Amherst Foundation has had some success in fundraising and is uh, also giving grants to um, Amherst businesses. Um, is there overlap uh, here and how would that work in terms of mm -hmm. identifying need? So we did talk about that with the chamber the other day, and they felt that 
the businesses that they are giving loans to were higher income businesses. And they were actually very happy that this would um, kind of bridge that gap a little bit. So, and we would, we would work closely with them. Right, and they'll also, I guess, not, not just in terms of, um, of um, income level, but also in terms of size, right? This is limited to five or fewer, so mm -hmm. the bigger enterprises could also take advantage of the other grants, right. I suppose. And they, they also have a second round for that. Um, I'm not quite sure when that is starting, but they feel like as they get more donations, they may keep going. So, um, you know, they, they did almost like a pilot to start out with, to see and learn from that. And then, like I said, my guess is within the next couple of weeks, they're gonna launch their second round. I think Nat, also to that question, right? I, you know, the town spoken with the bid and chamber and they indicated that, you know, the size of the business and um, there wouldn't be much overlap in terms of the businesses being supported through the two different programs. At the same time, you know, um, businesses are eligible for different, you know, federal programs now too. And what we're not precluding those businesses from applying to this program or being eligible, they just have to certify that they're not using block grant money for the same purposes. So kind of like no double dipping, but we're not, you know, we're not having a hard line here with a business. We know that some of this funding isn't necessarily enough. It's uh, for their, for the need. So for instance, if a business is getting, you know, PPE, you know, personal protection plan or other, you know, unemployment assistance or certain things, that's not going to preclude them if, you know, this money is going to another part of their business that isn't getting supported. So. Uh, Makes sense. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I've got a question also. Can I? Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I'm just wondering how, um, how many small businesses do you think there and how are out there uh, in the Amherst? And do you have a list already? Have you had contact or how would, they find out about it. So there isn't a list, as far as we know, especially of businesses that are five or under, five employees or under. There was some documentation um, about the number of businesses in that category. Uh, I believe it was around 500. Mm -hmm. So, but as far as we know, there is no list and um, we would um, obviously advertise it and promote it as with, with mm -hmm. the town would also, I mean, we're in partnership with Amherst as far as um, doing this grant. So we'd have to use mm -hmm. our networking resources to promote it. Do you have any sense of what kind of response you might get? I mean, have you well, been getting caught? I mean, it is, a different time it's like yeah it's i can i can speak to the fact that we ran the northampton program and the northampton program was a little bit different because it was labeled urgent need and so there wasn't a strict income certification for it uh, they still had to um, give us a profit and loss statement for 2019 but for this particular program, they're going to have to upload their taxes and give us um, some mm -hmm. certification for their income for the last six or eight months. So, um, you know, we had 88 applicants um, for that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's, really, it's really an unknown. Yeah. I will say quickly that, um, you know, I guess I, I just learned today that DHCD will allow um, through program design, if you know, the town and valley, we could opt for um, applicants to provide the last three months of uh, income as a, and then secondarily their tax returns. So this is new. Um, I just, like I said, I just actually got an email um, about 20 minutes ago, 10 minutes before the hearing started <laughs> saying that they let yeah. income verifications be done through kind of a, um, a projected or, or, you know, the last three months. So it's, you know, it's something that I'm sure we'll, we probably do as opposed to tax returns. But like I said, you know, that, that's something that just came out today. So that might open up the pool quite a bit 
um, because it's based on you know recent income, not you know your 18 or 19 tax return. So I think there'll I actually think there'll be you know plenty of responses. And in terms of marketing, you know the bid and chamber sent a support letter and we're working with them. Um, you know we have our list of businesses that have been licensed or other things. So there's ways to send out emails or notifications mm -hmm. to really get the word out. All right, any other questions for Dee, for Joanne? All right, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here today. Right. <laughs> and uh, so Joanne and Dee, I'll put you back as an attendee and then um, if that works. All right, are we ready for, um, is there someone from Family Outreach? There is, hold on a minute here. Yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. All right, so I think Laura, I'm assuming, let's see, Laura. And uh, Nate, if there are um, several people from one organization, can we try to limit it so no sure. one's taking the floor for too long because we've got one, two, three, four, five organizations to get through, um, agencies to get through, and. We just want to be mindful of time that we have a meeting after this. So sure. we've got numerous speakers. They really should try to limit their speaking time. Sure. Laura, is this Laura from Family Outreach? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, it's sure. Laura Reichsman. Let's see if I can start my video. Yes, hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Or is Francine or anyone else here, or is it? Is it are you presenting? Uh, I, I am presenting, and I might have one or two um, board members who came just to give support, but I don't know if they're here or not. Yeah, I see John Hornick's on. I know he wrote a letter from the trust, and if you have, if you let me, if you give me their names, I can always see if they're a, an attendee. Betsy or Michelle, or any of those. Yeah, Betsy's here. I can promote her to a panelist right now. Uh, Michelle. Uh, Michelle, yes, and she's promoted to a panelist. So Betsy and Michelle, you're now panelists with Laura, and you can unmute yourselves and start your video if you'd like. Well, okay, welcome, welcome, Laura. Oh, you know, what? sorry, Michelle, hold on a minute. Uh, there you are. Now you're should be coming through in a second. Uh, I'm not sure why that's not. Okay. Is Michelle? disappeared that I didn't do anything to them. <laughs> Thanks everyone for your patience. Panelist eight. I don't see, well, Laura and Betsy are here. I hope I didn't uh, just close out on um, Michelle. Hmm. Laura, would you wanna get started and we can see if Michelle yeah. is able to. Yeah. Absolutely. So we are um, requesting funds to provide assistance to families. Um, obviously, this is a, you know already almost three months old or three months old. So we've been doing the work already as it's reflected in our proposal. I've uh, listed what we have been working on. Um, we have, uh, you know, we work um, exclusively, mo generally with families. We work with one or two individuals sometimes, but for the most, we're experts in working with families. And, um, you know, everybody's been hit really hard. Uh, they lost their jobs and uh, they're isolated and they have small apartments with lots of kids. And um, so life is really challenging. And we've done a mix of working with folks remotely and now we're starting to do social distancing and actually getting to see somebody, but not up close. Uh, outreach right now is, is an interesting term. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing of course is unemployment, uh, housing right now with the um, moratorium, Everybody's very frightened. A lot of what we do right now is negotiating with landlords. Uh, we have some folks who, uh, because of their immigration status, don't have any, can't get any supports, can't get unemployment, uh, can't get food stamps or benefits, and they're really hurting. Um, and so we've been helping them a lot. We've also been helping uh, 
people come up with a plan for when those moratoriums for um, eviction uh, go away. Uh, and um, we're very experienced working with folks to um, get assistance. And that's, I think, a lot of what we'll be doing. Uh, all our caseworkers speak Spanish, which has been extremely helpful. Um, and we're well known. I think one of the things that I wrote about in the um, proposal as well is that we're getting a lot of calls and we're getting a lot of calls from people we don't know. And being uh, doing business in Amherst for 30 years, and I've been there for 28 of those 30 years, I know a lot of people. And a lot of the calls we're getting are from people who have not needed our assistance before. So um, that's really <laughs> the... Uh, the request and you, uh, the budget reflects both a part-time and a full-time person because I really wasn't sure how much money you had and how you were going to be able um, to distribute it. So I wanted to give options of, um, of how that would work. We'd be able to start um, doing the work the minute, you know, the day we got funding. Uh, we wouldn't have any lag time on that. And um, we try to help as many people as we can. Great, thank you. Is anybody else um, representing Family Outreach planning on speaking? <clears throat> I'll speak briefly if, if, if I'm if Betsy. Betsy, sorry, just quickly, Laura, if you have Michelle's number, I feel like maybe I, I. She had a computer problem, so she, um, she was rebooting. Okay, good, yeah, I feel bad. I wasn't sure if it was me, me or. No, it was her computer that had a problem. So she said just to go ahead, it's okay. Okay, okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, I've been on the board for 19 years. I've lived in Amherst for 20 years and we moved here. We didn't know that there was poverty in Amherst and I've had an education through family outreach of how deep the needs are for families in Amherst. Um, and the pandemic has just made it worse. I mean, it's, uh, Francine Rodriguez, who's the program manager said that she's getting twice as many calls as she was getting last year at this time. And, you know, people are, people are getting desperate. I mean, the fuel assistance stuff is going to come or the fuel, um, the, the, they're going to need fuel assistance because it's going to come off sometime. I don't know when the date is, but between losing housing and fuel assistance, people are going to be very scared. Trying to educate their children at home is tough. Uh, trying to navigate someone, someone tried to get a driver's license and had filled out all the paperwork, but spoke only Spanish and she gets, gets to the RMV and the person said, oh, well, you're gonna have to start over. And Francine got on the phone, spent three and a half hours on the phone with that person and got the license taken care of. And that's the kind of thing that Family Outreach does is the big stuff and the little stuff. And for somebody who needs a license to be able to get to work, that's a big thing. And for somebody who needs you know, food assistance or um, mental health issues and has, needs access to services, it's all of them are big issues. And so I have been so impressed with what Family Outreach does and the professionalism that they have and how organized they are so that they don't skip a beat. People will walk in and they will be taken care of. They will be seen. Um, Francine has a line that says the door never closes because we don't drop families when they seem to have graduated from services, but pandemic can send people who are even doing well back into needs and um, they're prepared but extra staffing would be good because they're already handling 650 families a year. And so an extra, an extra caseworker would be amazing to be able to spread it and also to predict that maybe they need programs that are uh, assistance programs that are different than what we're doing that are not, um, you know, not necessarily direct funding things, but would help with the mental health and the, the well-being of the clients. So Anyway, I hope you'll consider funding Family Outreach. It's really near and dear to my heart, but I, I know the quality of the work they do, and uh, Laura and her team are amazing. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. Good, yeah. to, good to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. Anybody from um, CDBG have questions for Laura or Betsy? I've got a quick one. Uh, Laura, what, what um, the new these new names what do you think the biggest need out there that you're hearing with these new families uh unemployment unemployment absolutely is huge is huge it is um 
it is quite the bureaucracy. It's quite the system. And so everything is set up with the expectation that somebody is computer literate, that somebody uh, can, even if you're an English speaker, some of the language, some of the hoops you have to jump through are really challenging. Uh, mm -hmm. Upload a file. What does that mean to some people, right? Mm -hmm. So all those things are really challenging. And um, I've been so impressed at how the caseworkers have been able to do this remotely. I mean, we live in an amazing time mm -hmm. um, because uh, Francine or Iris or, you know, we can get on these three way phone calls and we can really accomplish what we need to get accomplished. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would say um, uh, unemployment is uh, the first one. I, I think, um, th and of course the other one is just trying to maintain good relationships with neighbors, with crazy kids running around all day and, you know, all those things, negotiating with landlords. Um, you know, right now they can't send out, uh, you know, notices to quit. But, you know, the day that that moratorium went into, I think it was like, I don't know, April 14th. I'm just going to throw this out. But it was like April 14th at five o'clock. You couldn't um, send any, any more 15-day um, notices. Well, so what, ha what happens? Um, South Point sends out to all, all these families who have no income, they sent them out in the morning of that day. And Francine got on the call and she's talking to Bonnie and she's talking to the, this, you know, this new property manager and she's, you know, working with them because it's so scary. She, you know, then had to make probably 35 calls to families just to, to reassure them, no, you don't need to start packing. You know, it'll be okay. We'll be there. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll help you. So um, I would say, you know, that's, that's a lot of what we're seeing the new people and it's all it's all fear right fear that they're not going to be able to pay their rent feed, feed their children yeah mm -hmm. great thanks thanks um i see that kevin noonan has raised his hand um nate so do you want to call on him yeah uh i i gail you're right i can allow him to talk so he, kevin you're unmuted he's gonna unmute himself yeah kevin you have to unmute yourself but you're able to speak. I can unmute you. Here you go. Kevin, if you unmute your microphone, I'm trying right now, you should be able to speak. Are you having trouble? Try it one more time. Maybe I will try one more thing. I'll promote him to panelists. So now, Kevin, you can unmute yourself if you want to try that. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. This is not, where is Kevin? He disappeared. Can I ask, can I ask a question in the meantime? Sure. Um, uh, thanks, Laura. It's really gut wrenching to hear about all the just the explosion and need uh, that you're that you're seeing. Um, I guess my question is about um, the additional caseworker, full or part time, and uh, you said there wouldn't be any you know lag in getting up and running. Is this a new hire or no? It, it's such a short period of time that hiring somebody just just means one more person, you know, who's going to lose their job in nine months, right? Or a year or however long this funding goes on. So that's the good thing about us being part of the Center for Human Development is there's actually a number of caseworkers who are underutilized right now that can come work for me that day. Oh, wow. are, we're already in conversations with them. So um, we're, we, you know, we'll be able to hit the ground running. Very helpful. Thanks. Of, yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Kevin, are you there? Yes. Would you like to ask a question? Sorry, um, yes. Well, make we, a, a comment. Uh, we have a very yeah. slow internet connection here. And uh, so now I'm using my phone. Okay. Um, well, here we you. submitted an application, but we don't see our name on the screen. So we're wondering what happened. Sorry, what was that, Kevin? We, we submitted an application, but we don't see our name on the screen. So we're wondering. Uh, did you, you submitted it? an application? Yes, yes, sir. Yesterday. 
All right, I can take a look. Thanks. I can wait. I think, I think you've got two two uh, things of Zoom going. Yeah, but one one wasn't working. Let me get oh, out of that one. Yeah, he's showing up one, on his laptop. One I can't. Okay, sorry. Let me get out of the other one. Hmm. Yeah, that's the one with the bad internet. Okay, can I just um, bring it back to family outreach because we sure. want to keep moving forward? Does anybody else have any other questions for Laura or Betsy from the CDBG committee? Okay, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Betsy. And um, it's good to see you and hear you. Okay, Nate, in the meantime, are you, should we move on to Amos Community Connections while you look for Kevin's proposal? Yeah, um, Kevin, if you can hear me, can you resend that? I don't see it um, anywhere. In my, uh, yeah, I don't, this. Ah. Sorry, it went into a, a secondary spam folder. <laughs> I guess that's not that funny. I don't know why that would have um, out there. I, I can forward that to the committee okay, and I can great. just, I can update that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, is there someone um, from Amherst, Amherst Community Connections that is going to present? Yeah, let me see if. Uh, Anyone's here? If anyone's here for Am uh, Amherst Community Connections, you could raise your hand. I don't see them on the um, on the attendee list right now. I can send a quick email. We could uh, skip them and then come back. I do. All right. Let's see. So I, I can forward the. Um, let me just forward the um, Kevin's email. I'm not sure. Oh, good. I can forward that on to the um, to the committee. I don't know why that. Can, you, can you just share the name of the proposal of the agency? Oh, uh, so Craig's Doors had submitted one. Kevin, you know, representing Craig's Doors, okay. um, and I'll just forward that on right now. Great. And let me email Amherst Community Connections too. I thought that they were. Everyone else seemed to be aware that they were, there was a hearing. So right. are they just all hanging out somewhere in, a, in another? They're like, they're in the attendee um, pool, you know, so there's, um, I right, so I've just sent everyone the um, Craig's doors okay. and I don't see anyone from uh, Amherst Community Connections. I'll, I'll send them an email and maybe we, we can just move on. Um, all right, um, so that would bring us to the literacy project. Can you? Let us know who it, uh, is Judith representing. Judith here, yeah. And I'll, Judith, I'll promote you. You, um, I'll promote you to panelists, Judith, so you'll be able to speak. So you should be promoted to panelists. Yeah. And Laura, panelists, let's see. Judith, you can unmute yourself now and start your video if you'd like. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Judith Roberts. I'm the director of the Literacy Project. And um, we applied for um, funding. We've gone online with our classes for the, obviously, for the safety of our students and staff. And um, um, we've applied for some funding for um, to support our online classes um, for with um, books to send home and um, also um, um, online learning programs and um, to teach readers and um, Zoom accounts for our teachers because we're using Zoom for our classes. Um, and um, I would also like to add, if I could, um, to our proposal to request um, a total of $10,000 from the committee rather than four, I'd like to add 
um, $6,000, which is um, a little bit less. We have five locations. So the $6,000 is a little bit less than a fifth of the salary of our program director who is working really hard to make this online learning work. And we started it on March 16th. So we had some, we have some experience now with how it works for our students during the crisis. And, um, but then when we come back in the fall, it, we want to, not be really responding crisis response, but we want to have a steady, really strong connection with all of our students. And one thing we found that many of our students can't afford computers and we're using um, donations, not CDBG money, to provide our students with laptops to work at home. And, um, when we open up, after, we're closed for the summer, but when we reopen in September, we're going to devote ourselves to at least the first month is going to be teaching computer literacy to our students. And we will still meet one-on-one -on -one with students with social distancing and masks, et cetera, at the JCA, which is where we're located, but we will have all of our classes on um, Zoom and what we're really focusing on is um, we're a high school equivalency readiness program. So um, we're focusing on getting people ready to take and pass the high school equivalency test, which is called the HiSET test, stands for high school equivalency test, and which is very, very important for the adults that we teach um, to get them ready a lot of people are out of work now, worked in restaurants, et cetera. And, but folks are getting ready for job training programs. And it does say on the um, plan for today that we, that job training and online classes. We actually don't do job training, but we get people ready to work with our partners, Holyoke Community College, Greenfield Community College, and the Franklin Hampshire Career Center that do job training for jobs that are really needed right now during the pandemic, um, certified nursing assistants, EMTs, uh, medical assistants, community health workers, and folks have to have a high school degree or a high school equivalency degree. So that's what we are providing students with is the high school equivalency degree. So we teach adults. And um, the adults we work with um, go to the Family Outreach Center. They use the Amherst Survival Center. So we create a web. Um, we really are sort of in the business of teaching people to fish. So we're in the business of preparing people to be better able to support themselves and their families and get the jobs that are going to be out there that will continue to be out there as we go through the pandemic and beyond. Um, so I just want to state that I'd like to increase my request to $10,000 and I can um, substantiate that, but the six, the 4,000 is for supplies and materials for online classes. And the 6,000 is, as I said, um, less than a fifth of our program directors. So we expect each of our sites to uh, contribute something. Um, do people have questions for me? I'm frozen. Oh, um, Any questions for Judith on the committee? It doesn't seem like it. Okay. Can you hear me? So I hope I was clear. Um, Literacy Project does not do job training. We're getting people ready to enter into job training programs by getting them um, ready to take and pass the high school equivalency test, which is really key. You can't enter these job training programs without that. So that's the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, 
And before I leave, I just want to apologize in advance. I have another Zoom meeting at five o'clock that I have to go to, but um, so I'm going to sign off in a few minutes here. I know. Thanks, Judith. I, I um, yeah, I, I, mean, I was able to hear you and everything, so I, I think that worked. And we've noted the increase from four thousand to ten thousand on our um, proposal. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for um, being here and doing the work that you do and, and listening to me. I see that it's a little hard to see me because I have a bright window behind me. Thank you for all the work you do and thank you for being here today. Thanks. Okay. Um, so before we head to Amherst Survival Center, any word, um, Nate, from anybody from Amherst Community Connections? I have not heard anything. Um, okay. Somewhat unusual, but had they indicated, had they indicated they would be here today? Um, we, you know, through email, I thought they were aware of it. Um, so I'm not sure okay. why that wouldn't be the case. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, should we move on to the survival center? Sure, that sounds good. And I'll. Um, and and Lev will be presenting. Yeah, she may name others. So Lev, I'll, I'll promote you to panelists and then you can... Um, and is the plan sort of to end this portion of our meeting at five and then we meet for the next meeting part? At five? Uh, I think, you know, as a hearing, we can, you know, until we, we've we um, heard from everyone, you know, it doesn't, there's no hard and fast rule that five was an end time. Um, so I don't... Okay. That might give some time for someone from Amherst Community Connections to chime in. Mm -hmm. So Lev, I think you're available to speak if you'd like. Great, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, excellent. Um, well, thank you so much and thanks to the committee for convening this hearing. Um, the Amherst Survival Center, as you know, has submitted a request for $100,000 in CDBG coronavirus funds um, to ensure the food security of 3,000 low to moderate income Amherst residents um, by dramatically expanding our food pantry operations. So since March, we have really been focused on these two parallel public health crises that we are seeing in Amherst, certainly COVID-19 and also the public health crisis of food insecurity. The situation is certainly dire now, and we also know that as we start to recover and the economy reopens that unemployment is going to persist for our lowest wage workers, those with less education, um, those with limited English language skills, etc. And so that unfortunately this public health crisis of food insecurity is dramatically increased right now and is going to persist. It's Worthy to note that before COVID-19, the Amherst Survival Center was serving about 2,000 Amherst residents in our food pantry. And these were folks who were struggling financially when the economy was supposedly thriving. We are seeing these folks much worse off. They need more food and more consistently in order to just make ends meet. We're seeing individuals who are homeless, who no longer have access to public spaces or the friends' houses who might have let them stay sometimes or helped supported them and are experiencing um, a great loss there. We're providing extra meals for those folks, special ready to eat allocations from our pantry um, and have been really pleased to also help connect folks to expanded services that Craig's Doors is working to create out of their um, resource center as well, which I believe um, that they will be speaking to. We also have residents coming to the Amherst Survival Center who uh, one person told me that she used to coupon the heck out of savings. Her regular shopping trips for her family consisted of going to six different grocery stores, and that was how she was able to feed her family on her incredibly tight budget, only buying the things that were on sale and that she had coupons for. She can't do that anymore. Those items aren't on the shelf. It's not safe to go to that many grocery stores, and so she's needing the Amherst um, Survival Center Food Pantry more than ever. 
And then we also have this whole group of low and moderate income Amherst residents who were previously food secure, who had enough food. They may have been on the borderline or not. They may have really been okay. And that they are now experiencing significant food insecurity for the first time. They're unemployed. Um, both of the adults in the household are unemployed. Other people in their extended families who they might have turned to for help are also struggling. Last week, uh, compared to the same week last year, almost four times as many, 383% as many people registered for the food pantry for the first time. That was 69 new people in one week um, out of the 538 people that we served compared to only 18 new people in that same time period last year. This, this reality of folks who have not previously come to access services here is significant. Um, and that number doesn't even include people who haven't been in a year or two or three. That's literally folks who have never come before. 25% um, more Amherst residents accessed the food pantry in that one week alone. I think this is a good moment to, um, at this hearing to recognize the absolutely incredible support from the community through this time. We've received financial contributions. Um, a local sixth grader just did a toiletry drive for her final project at school. Um, and our volunteers, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, many of your neighbors and your friends have been volunteering here through this crisis, several of them as many as four days per week. Um, the support from the individuals in, in this community has, has been incredible. And to continue at this level and to expand in the ways that we know we need to and are ready to, we need support from the town. Um, so with this investment that we're requesting of $100,000 from the CDBG coronavirus funds, we would be able to provide monthly groceries for 3,000 low and moderate income Amherst residents. We would be able to improve access for those with COVID related health and transportation barriers by offering delivery to between 700 and 1,000 Amherst residents, as well as on site no contact curbside pickup and on site minimal contact pickup. We would be able to increase our food allocations to two weeks instead of one week per month, um, filling that gap. We're hearing consistently from families that the allocation is not enough. We would offer a new emergency box mid-month supplement, um, providing extra food if people need more. Would be expanding evening and weekend hours for low wage workers returning to work. Um, and this also supports where even to maintain that sort of same number of participant levels, the costs of operation amidst COVID-19 are really significant. Um, I'm impressed every day by the team here, staff and volunteers who really seemingly overnight have successfully sh shifted operations to offer food throughout this crisis, to offer kindness and compassion to people who are so scared. People are so scared. They are scared, they need food, they don't know what they're going to do. Um, and the folks, the team here has not missed a beat or a single day of service. And in fact, over the last two months is now growing and growing, and growing. Um, this month, we uh, delivered more than 12,000 meals worth of groceries to 300 Amherst residents. Um, considering that before COVID only a few months ago, we delivered to a, about 50 seniors. Um, that's a phenomenal new service that's offered and we are we have the ability and readiness to continue to scale that to meet the dramatic need that we're seeing. I know that $100,000 is a big number, which is what we're requesting from the CDBG COVID funds, um, but so is 3,000, which is the number of Amherst residents served. Um, what's not a big number is the $91 per year per Amherst residents that that this service then costs. That's less than $8 a month per person for up to two weeks of groceries picked up or delivered to their door. And less than half of that is CDBG funds, including both the CDBG CARES funds as well as the other town allocation combined. 
the total cost of the Amherst pantry is $274,000. We have some of that secured. We're requesting $100,000 from the CDBG coronavirus. Um, and then we'll be raising, we'll need to raise $350,000 from individual donors to support the pantry as a whole, um, roughly half of which uh, is supporting Amherst residents. So it is an incredible honor to get to be a part of this organization through this time. Um, I've never been more proud of what I get to do every day and how critical these services are. It has never been more, it's never been more evident. The, the role of the center in the town um, and the support for Amherst residents has, has never been more clear. So we are in the process of gearing up. We are doing this. Um, it is it is working. Um, we have the readiness to continue to scale and we really need the town support uh, to get us there. So I really, really appreciate your uh, your consideration of this of this significant ask. Um, it will have an enormous impact on um, 3000 Amherst residents. Thank you so much, Lev. Uh, is there anybody else with you? With yeah. You from the Survival Center? Yes. Um, I believe that um, Rory is on the line, if you see her name. Yeah, you're, Rory is now up more as a panelist. Yeah. Great. And then Jan Idelson um, is also going to speak. Um, Ted is here, but is happy to cede his time so we can move things along. But I would um, love the to give the opportunity to Rory and Jan. All right, Jan, you're also being promoted to panelist. Right. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Lev. Uh, so who's going next, Rory? Sure. Am I here? Yes. We hear you. OK, can you see me? No. Uh, not yet. It, it, it's, it's up to you. Sometimes I stay hidden. <laughs> I don't know how to do that. This doesn't look like the other Zoom that I've participated in. That's why um, we can hear you. Okay. Well, my name is Rory Woods. I am, um, oh, start my video. There we go. Hi. We see you. You, you see me now? Yes. Terrific. I can't see myself, but that's probably for the best. Uh, so thank you for having me. My name is Rory Woods. I'm a regular participant at the Amherst Survival Center. Um, I'm a homeless person. I'm sitting in, an, uh, in a, at a lovely conference room in a, an Amherst office space right now that I've been uh, allowed to use. Um, so I rely upon the Amherst Survival Center for my very survival. They are so aptly named and they have been so consistent and so terrific. I just, the, the support from these people during this time has just been overwhelming uh, to me because it, it you know, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have any place to bathe otherwise. I have relied upon the Amherst Survival Center for my, my personal hygiene needs for the past 18 months. And I, you know, that they're open four days a week for that. Um, otherwise, I had five or six friends throughout the valley from East Hampton, uh, North Hampton, Amherst, um, and Pelham that I would stop in on and I would make them dinner and, you know, try to help out around the house in exchange for, you know, a bath. Um, now it's just the four times a week. People don't want me in their house. They, they, sorry, Rory, can't come in, stay 10 feet away kind of thing. So that's how it is. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm still getting by. I can, I can survive on four showers a week. It works for me. Uh, so far so good. Um, but the food pantry is critical because there aren't so many places, uh, you know, there's no, there's no places for me now to go and like those same friends that would let me use the bathtub would let me use their kitchen, particularly if I made dinner for them. <laughs> it was a great arrangement, but that's no longer possible. Um, and the food pantry uh, has prepared food. You know, it's cold, but that's fine. It's great. Um, so I'm getting by. And I'm even able to help out a friend of mine who's a single mother who's now stuck at home with her children uh, in their apartment in Rolling Green where um, they don't have a car. And the kids aren't comfortable going to the Amherst Survival Center or to the churches for the meals. So because I do have a vehicle, I'm able to pick up for them and bring food to them. I also have a friend who's a senior who's a shut-in um, at this point because she's afraid, she's just afraid to interact with the world. You know, she has too many... Um, you know, uh, 
risk factors for the COVID situation so that I'm able to bring food to that person as well. And so those are regular things that I can do to feel like I'm giving back a little bit to, um, to, to my community. Uh, so I would just want to emphasize how great uh, the support of the Amherst Survival Center has been for me and that literally I, I, I absolutely depend upon them for my survival. And I'm seeing, I'm seeing the, just like Lev said, that it's like Grand Central Station over there. It's mind boggling to me how, how well they're managing it. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Does anybody from the committee have a question for Rory? Okay, thank you, Rory, and on to Jan. Hello. Hi, Jan. Can you hear and see me? Got you. <laughs> okay. I know you want to keep this brief. There are two things. I want to read first a letter from Dina Kapinski, uh, a, a, a participant. She says, among the fine aspects of the life in Amherst, Massachusetts is the existence of the Amherst Survival Center. The Survival Center provides a community with incalculable good survival, yes, but very importantly, heart also. Certainly at this time of COVID-19, without the Survival Center's dependable and prompt food aid, life would have been so much more difficult for some and I know it would have been terribly hard for me. The Survival Center provides a lifeline. There is dependability and encouragement, and that helps me feel hope. And I and others are, more, are most grateful. The Survival Center helps people help themselves. That's a fine thing. We must do what we can to help it continue. Beautiful. Thank you. And that is Gina. She lives at Chestnut Court. And now I'm going to add another two minutes. Um, I'm speaking as a former Amherst Survival Center president, but most importantly, a current daily volunteer. And we need your support. In the past 15, day, 15 years, along with you all, I have witnessed the Survival Center grow, adapt, and grow again. Our neighbors tell us how they want support and we provide it with compassion and dignity. It is not surprising to me, the Amherst Survival Center has met this pandemic head on. I have watched the staff as they created a safety infrastructure to assure a healthy environment to all who enter our parking lot and their building. Our huge dining hall is now a pantry. Our parking lot is now our fresh food and lunch distribution area. We are continuing to be neighbors supporting neighbors. This is a time where our strength continues to be unwavering with committed volunteers, staff, and a healthy leadership team. We welcome around 120 Amherst residents a day. Some are here for lunch. Do you want meat or vegetarian? Do you want it cold or hot? Are there others hungry at home? Would you like a bag of fruit, a bag of vegetables, bread, dessert? How about some water? People might come here for lunches, but they find out about our pantry because many people are new. And this is daily. So you already know about our pantry. Um, Amherst neighbors leave here with about a week's worth of food every month, but that's not enough right now. We need to double that. We need to double it as soon as possible, and we really need your help with this. Our neighbors are depending on us. Sometimes I get to answer the phone, and neighbors will call. They are desperate, and they are scared. They don't know what the future is. None of us do. They need food. I answer the phone. They're scared. I say, come on in. Um, some are afraid to leave their car. I said, don't worry. You come in. We'll bring it to your car. Some can't get to us. I say, no problem, we'll bring it to your doorstep. That's what we've always done. That's the way we do things. We help people where they're at. So before the pandemic, the Survival Center led the way in best practices in providing help to our Amherst neighbors. Now with the pandemic, we are continuing to provide even more food to Amherst. We need the town support to keep going this amazing work that our community counts on. As successful as the Amherst Survival Center has been, 
it has come with an emotional, physical, and financial toll. I can say that personally too. I've never worked so hard in my life. <laughs> So I'm asking the town to ensure that we are able to continue to support our neighbors during this time, this horrible nightmare. With compassion, no Amherst neighbor will be turned away. With determination, we will continue to meet the community's needs. And with integrity, we are as transparent as glass. And with the town's help, the entire town may be able to sleep a tad better at night. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, anybody have a question for Jan or Lev or Rory before we end their presentation time? Okay, thank you. you got, yeah, I do. Um, have you guys seen any leveling <laughs> off or tapering off of um, registrations since uh, Governor Baker reopened the, uh, the state? That's a great question, um, Keith. I, I think we will need to look at longer trend lines to be able to make that determination. Um, as I noted last week, was that was actually another peak um, in new registrations. Um, we hadn't seen that level since the early weeks of the crisis. Um, so it's hard to say exactly what combination of new people um, coming in versus also our continued outreach and making food more accessible for folks who need it. Um, but no, we haven't seen that um, shift yet. I think we'll have to probably wait a couple of months to start to see that that impact play out. Um, I think anecdotally, um, one of the pieces that we hear is that folks have they have gotten so far behind um, on bills on expenses etc um, and also we know that as these because of such a high unemployment rate um, which is particularly true in amherst unfortunately we're at one of the higher unemployment rates in the state at this point or new rates for new claims at least um, that it's these folks who are lower wage workers or have less formal education or other things that make it hard. They're, they're not the first folks to re-enter into the workforce. Um, and so I, I'm not surprised by the fact that we haven't seen that yet, but it's certainly something we'll, we'll continue to watch the numbers in the weeks to come. Thank you. So I have a question. And yeah. um, I know that in some communities, um, public schools have been supplementing meals for families um, and I didn't see this in the proposal and I wondered if there's any partnership between you and the public schools or you and UMass to help um, manage this time of crisis with getting enough food out in the community. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, the Amherst Public Schools uh, have done an impressive job partnering with UMass with the Baby Burke Trucks to um, have lunches available at a variety of community locations for any Amherst Public School child um, through this period of time, similar to the Summer Meals Program that has been offered in past years. Uh, what we have heard is that for some families, this works really well. Um, and for some families, this has really not been a match either because they tend to um, distribute food for a very brief window of time. Um, we've actually heard from some families that that timing conflicts with times that their kids have mandatory Zoom classes. And so they're not able to get to the lunch or perhaps it's just that it's too close and so they can't get there. For others, it's not convenient um, or and the, the different trucks offer different foods and you know whether or not the kids like it. So it, it seems like it has been an amazing resource for some families and then there are a number of other families that are really not utilizing it. We were, because of that offering, um, in March we were in conversation with the schools around what they were gonna do to try to figure out our response. Um, and because we knew of that offering, we kept our allocations basically the same in the month of March. But then um, we started to hear throughout April more need from families and so started to scale up. So beginning in May, we've put together a 
significant kids boost. So every um, so that families of school age children get an additional um, set of groceries. It's additional non perishables, extra ingredients to kind of make kid friendly meals, uh, extra meat, extra dairy, extra milk, extra cheese, um, more cereal. <laughs> um, I know how many boxes of cereal we are going through in my house. Um, and so uh, extra cereal and other things um, are included in that. So we're now giving that um, out and plan to continue to do that. So we have certainly been hearing from families that that uh, school meal gap um, is significant. Thanks. And, the, and your, the, the, I'm sorry, just can I just finish now? Mm -hmm. um, the boost program you started in May for kids that'll continue through the summer as you typically mimicking the temp typical boost program you have for the summer. Yeah, it will continue um, without getting into too much details. It's it's a slightly different sort of set of groceries and points, but yes, it's extra food for um, every school age kid. Um, and that will absolutely continue through the summer. Um, and in fact, is is one of the areas where um, I think we, we need to really further bolster the amount of additional food that we're providing there. Great, thank you. Um, Nat, did you have a question? I was gonna say that Ted Parker's raised his hand and I don't know you want him to speak. It seems like he wants to. <laughs> yes, I would love to let Ted speak. <laughs> Ted, you should be allowed to talk now. Hey, Ted, we should be able to hear you if you're. Yep. There we go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yes, we Great. can. Um, I just wanted to point out uh, that pandemic uninsurance, uh, unemployment insurance expires in July and it's unlikely to be extended um, by the federal government. And I think that there may be a surge later on in, in, in demand for the survival center services when folks who are currently making close to what they were making employed or maybe even a little more um, will be uh, no longer uh, have those funds available. And so I'm not sure that uh, we've seen the high point of demand for um, uh, pantry at, at the survival center. Thank you. May I comment? Who's, I, I don't know who's it's, the It's Rory Woods. Yes, go ahead, thank you. I just wanna offer my anecdotal uh, experience on that. Um, I was formerly employed part-time in the food service industry as a server. I was laid off with uh, the entire restaurant on um, March 13th, and we were all told that the restaurant was closing permanently, and that if and when they reopened, we'd all have to reapply. Um, it, the outlook is not good for me being reemployed again anytime soon. Thank you. All right. Uh, anybody else from CDBG have questions for Ted, Rory, Jan, or Lev? Okay, thank you, Amherst Survival Center participants. Yes, thank I, you. I saw that um, Nate, I saw that Wei Ling had raised her hand, so we're going to go back to Amherst Community Connections. Sure, let me just um, do a little. And may I ask a question, or will this do you need silence to do this? Um, you can ask a question. I'm not, who's the question to? All of us, because given that we just got the pre stores proposal, sure. we, we don't really have sufficient time to look at it while we're live sure. here. So should we um, talk about that later on and figure out how to move forward with that? That, that can be the, um, I mean, that can, you know, we can have Kevin present at the end and then, um, you know, uh, we could always, the committee could always meet again since the deadline has been extended or, um, you know, if you think you understand it, um, you know, make recommendations, uh, you know, a preliminary set of recommendations to the town manager. Okay. All um, right, Wei Ling, I'm gonna make you a panelist so you can present your proposal. So you should be able to unmute yourself. And start your video if you'd like. And so can everyone still see my screen? Is that what's what's visible? Is the chart? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Okay. I apologize for wasn't well not being here. I was too wrapped up in a casework. 
that's okay. We are here now and we're still here too. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Good. You're welcome and um, give us your time. Thank you. I didn't realize that the uh, present, the uh, submission uh, folks are supposed to be here doing a presentation. So I apologize if I'm not well prepared. So you would like me to prepare uh, to present the proposal that I've submitted? Well, you don't really need to propose. I mean, we all, we've all read it. Uh -huh. um, and it was, um, you know, we have three pages of um, the, the document and then a page of your budget. So I don't think for sake for your time sake that you need to propose to, to give it to us out loud. But if you want to give us some features or anything that's happened since you submitted this that you'd like to let us know or give us some salient points. Okay, great. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm very grateful for uh, giving the opportunity to present it. So uh, because of the COVID-19, uh, our office has to adapt to the time. So on March 15th, when we got the information that the Governor Baker has asked for stay at home uh, order. So we right away on the very day we started doing the preparation for the remote casework and we call that tele-support. So started in March of 15th, we went ahead, gathered everybody's uh, information and put it in the digital format. So we have been doing the tele-support and uh, uh, since March 15th for the past 10 plus weeks now. And we found uh, even though we are not able to see uh, the clients face to face to help them address the struggles they are going through, such as behind on rent or struggling with substance abuse, needing referrals or needing application for food stamp because something happened, they were left out of the food stamp application pool. So all these things we are able to do it online for them through our tele-support. So we have built a database of uh, 200 plus, 260 plus of participants that we served this past year and able to reach out to them with the help of five caseworkers doing it in, uh, through the telephone and email technology and by providing the information and assisting them to apply for funding, whether it's rent assistance or food stamp, we are able to help them stay put, stay at home, not having to worry about going out, asking for help when nobody is open. So that's the feature of our COVID-19 coping strategy as an agency. And uh, the work is very gratifying given uh, places are shut down, um, we are still able to reach out to the people we have been working with. So we intend to continue this feature of the work. But now our agency has started opening up. So we are able to also provide in-office visit. But because of the safe distancing need, we can do appointments only when we used to do the drop-ins which uh, will make the safe distancing impossible. So to augment the tele-support, we are now opening to do the in-person by appointment of visits. So again, through these two combination, we can uh, provide the same, if not more, service to the folks at their convenience and uh, to help them stay stabilized in their housing and uh, to help the people who are homeless struggling because of our two uh, housing programs, the Housing First and uh, the Rental Subsidy Program. At the same time, when we do the case management, we have housing available to place them, funding available for them to get into their housing. So this is the housing-based support service in the time of COVID-19 through technology and through in-office support, we are able to keep our Amherst residents sheltered in place. And uh, that's my spiel. So if you have any question, I'm here to answer your questions. Hi, does anybody mind if I jump in? No, nope, uh, go ahead. So um, 
Weiling, on the page three of your proposal, it says that you're asking for $47,000 for the program proposed. And then on the, um, and then because other organizations that usually get funding from have pushed their funding forward, I just want to make sure I'm understanding this, to fiscal 2022, you're asking for an additional 37. Is that correct? And so Bill, now could you, uh, do you mind if I can go get a copy of this proposal? Yeah. Thank yeah, you yeah. so much. Yeah, go ahead. We'll be right back. Okay. I just needed to get clarity because. Uh, yeah, sure. yeah Nate's, Nate's summary um, had the budget as 83500 but the way I read the proposal was that the request was for 37000 from the CDBG funds and the rest would be covered by other. Yeah, I thought it just seemed confusing. I mean, on the revenue side, it, it seems to be clear. And then I guess on the expense side, I didn't understand it as much. So I yeah, just, yeah, it could have been my mistake too. I just, um, it'll, it'll be good. And for everyone who's still uh, listening on the computer, thanks. We have, um, you know, um, Kevin Noonan will present and we also have someone from PVPC who will present after um, Amherst Community Connections. And um, when, when we're done taking public comment, the public hearing can be closed and the committee will still meet and you can still stay um, an attendee and the committee will discuss uh, the preliminary recommendations for the town manager. Hi, I'm back now. So it's, the, it's um, item number four, letter B on page three, the budget. And so you're asking for 47,000 for the proposed program. And then I didn't really understand about the additional 37,000. So can you just give a brief explanation about that? Sure. The 37,000, I assume, given the positive news that we learned early this year, that the committee has recommended us to be uh, one of the five agencies that will be receiving the uh, CVBG funding. So my assumption is that our agency has been recommended for this round of CDBG, so we will be receiving that. Okay, so your ask is for forty-seven, yes. not for eighty-three-five. Okay, yeah. Sorry, that was my yep, my mistake. Okay. okay, that's okay. I just wanted. I to understand because many other agencies, such as my colleagues, Amherst Survival Center or Family Outreach of Amherst or Quake Stores, <laughs> everyone has really a population that they have different needs. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that we are able to share our, you know, resources to okay. allow everybody to serve the population who have unique needs. So I would only ask for 80, 47. Okay. And hopefully that we can get funded, put together. We will work 100%, even though we will not get 100% of the funding. Right. So CDBG committee members, you have to make that notation in your um, spreadsheet that um, is on the screen right now. Yeah, I can change that. Okay, and um, you might want to change uh, literacy project to 10 as well. Okay, yeah. anybody else have a question for Wei Lang? Uh, yes, I had a question if that's okay. Um, uh, the proposal is for the program manager and uh, caseworkers. Are these new, new hires? <coughs> or have they been identified or how does that work? Um, because we will be serving people in a different way. And originally our understanding is based on our projection that we will be serving 350 plus people. That was the last year and the year before total number of people we serve. So we figure in order to serve that same number of people, we will have to have similar staff coverage. So it will not be a new hire, but based on the 350 projection, the staffing level will be such. So therefore it's not a new hire, but just was in the uh, grant proposal to the EDBG this past winter, this past November, when you were reviewing it, that's the same budget I was using. So not a new hire, but you'll increase the hours of your current staff. That's the answer. 
Say that again. It's not a new hire. You're going to increase the hours of your current staff. We are not, just because the two agencies that we were applying for grant, I think I mentioned that in my proposal, the United Way and the Community Foundation of Western Mass, they have new funding priorities, such as food. So therefore, they were not able to cover the grant money that we were requesting because of the new funding priorities. And we are short. In order to do what we committed to doing, so we are coming back to the community when proposed uh, CDBG to see whether we could ask you for assistance. Okay. I understand. So it's, a, it's the same um, as last year. It's just that the 47,000 that you were hoping to get from the United Way and Community Foundation didn't come through. Correct. So to try to keep the same program, you request it, you're requesting additional uh, funding to um, be able to complete the proposal that you had brought to us last year. Correct. Yes, Mr. Yes. Lawson, correct. Thank you, um, Matt, for clarifying. Um, anybody else have a question for Wei Ling? Anybody else? Okay. Uh, Wei Ling, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I will hang in here a little bit to listen in to uh, Mr. Nunes' uh, discussion. Okay, and Nate will now uh, bring Kevin in. Oh, we're bringing uh, from PDPC first. Oh, right. Sorry about that. Okay. So, who do we have from PDPC? Let's see. Um, PVPC, you can unmute yourself, yet yeah, you're... Hi, everyone can hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate this opportunity. Um, this proposal comes from PVPC, from the Domestic Violence Prevention Project Manager, Monica Moran. Um, she's unable to attend the meeting. I've worked closely with her in the preparation of this project and if, if funded, uh, will be part of the execution. So I'm happy to review and present and ask questions, answer questions. Um, the proposal, as you saw, is in response to an uptick in lethality and dangerousness in domestic violence that has occurred during the pandemic. Um, that's international, national, regional. Um, the, uh, the pandemic and the cause and the consequences don't cause domestic violence, as you know, but the people who perpetrate it uh, and their set of values believe that under the under conditions that they don't like, they actually have the right to use the control and violence they need to. And the pandemic creates many stressful conditions that they don't like. Um, I run, I have founded and run the perpetration services throughout Western Mass that serve Amherst area. And so through our discussions, we realize there's a big gap in service. Most of the messaging has been in order to deal with safety under the increased risk has been to advise uh, survivors who are now um, sheltering at home or taking refuge in places that are no shelter, no safe, where there's no safety or refuge, advises people to um, stay out of the kitchen where weapons are and strategies that we know are not very effective. Um, but people do what they have to do. And so through our discussions, because I work primarily in developing perpetration services, so I've worked in survivor services for over 30 years, so I do both sides. We realized there was no service or messages directly to prevent and respond to people who are maybe violent or are, have been violent. Um, the United States doesn't have a helpline. Uh, there is no state that has a statewide helpline for people who may perpetrate. However, doing some research, the United Kingdom has had one for 17 years. New Zealand has one, and they're showing a 200 uh, in um, 
I think it's Australia as well, uh, a 200% increase in use of messaging, text, and phone communication in the United Kingdom, and I think it's 73% um, in the ones down under, where people who might be violent are actually reaching out for help for pe from people who are very, very skillful in helping um, interrupt, de-escalate, reframe, and work with people who have this form of tendency towards violence, which is different, as we know, than generalized violence. Um, so the proposal is to invite Amherst into a regional application. There are 19 towns that are committed and seven that are considering, we're hoping you're one of the ones considering, um, to uh, have a three-pronged project. One would be to create this helpline. We are working with the Department of Public Health and folks who certify the Intimate Partner Abuse Education Perpe uh, Perpetration Services to get their advice on structure. And um, also we're partnering with Behavioral Health Network, which um, has the state certified intimate partner abuse education perpetration services for most of Western Mass. So the first part would be a helpline to um, staffed by people already certified, but the money would be used to increase hours. So people would already be trained. Um, to respond and prevent uh, domestic violence by dealing directly with people who may perpetrate, which is a real innovation for us and we think it's long overdue. The second part would have um, service provision for them because people have um, uh, associated needs, like, un, like we know from running these services, unmet addiction needs, they also are struggling with income, needing food, housing, and need help connecting them um, to resources. And the third prong would be to provide advocacy services to the partners who are living with the people who may or have perpetrated violence. And if they um, live in an area um, or would accept local advocacy services, we would refer to those. But our research shows that um, the majority of survivors of, who are living with the people who are perpetrating, who are getting help, do not uh, go to traditional advocacy services. They don't want shelter. Um, and, and in times like that, especially if they're more rural or they're needing to be around the network of their family or in times like this where shelter, domestic violence shelters are not are limited to accept half the people they might have, it's not even an option. So working with them to um, manage what's happening and also come up with plans that are realistic for them would be the third prong. So three prongs would be a helpline, services for people who might perpetrate, and services for survivors. And um, for a little context, there is, uh, it's a very unbalanced uh, service provision in Massachusetts. Uh, there are over 40 24 seven hotlines for survivors. I've worked on them myself and there are none for people who might perpetrate. And there are services that provide uh, 14 certified programs in Massachusetts that provide services primarily through the criminal justice system and pro a probation condition to 2,500 people who perpetrate violence as opposed to community-based advocacy programs that provide service to uh, between 11 and 12,000 survivors. So there's a lot of people not being helped and it's a real missed opportunity to prevent. Um, we're trying to change the conversation so that we don't think of domestic violence as an inevitability, that we have to deal with the aftermath, but prevent it by engaging the people who uh, perpetrate it. So what questions do you have? Anybody have a question? Paul? Yeah. There we go, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So w where um, physically with this, um, I mean, how, what's your plan about having this phone line um, so people can call, but is it in an office somewhere or is it at people's homes or? So usually, hold on, and my thing says battery low and I thought I was plugged in. I just want to check my okay. outlet. One sec. <laughs> okay.
Okay, I'm plugged in. I had the wrong computer plugged in. So we, I have set up other hotlines in the area. So I'm familiar, we're using that model mm -hmm. where you have people um, who are local to the region who are already trained, which we do have. We have um, through Behavioral Health Network's Proteus Project, we have people who live all throughout Western Mass who are already trained in intimate partner abuse education perpetration intervention. So mm -hmm. they would have a work cell phone that they carry and take shifts um, all throughout Western Mass. And then they would meet weekly to do, uh, well, on Zoom until we're allowed to meet together to, to get supervision, to debrief. And then the, um, the actual people who provide the advocacy services, we actually are still in discussion. There's an office that exists in um, Palmer and in the Ware, where per, and in Northampton, where perpetration services are offered. So we're just looking at where's the best place to maybe sprinkle people throughout Western Mass, because there's 19 towns uh, participating to see uh, for when it's time to do in-person work where they should be situated. While it's remote or phone, it's going to be easier. So people that call in, uh, there'll be somebody that has a cell phone that gets handed off. Susan. Yeah, you go, it, you get a number and then the number uh, can be programmed to go to other numbers like so that okay. whoever has the shift from 12 to 8 gets the call because that's their schedule. So, yeah. um, and these calls, w looking at how it's done in um, with the RESPECT program in the UK and uh, the, where they have a high level of training. It takes a long time for someone who's perpetrated or thinking of it to actually get to the point of the, unlike other hotlines where they're saying, I need help with this. So they can take about 35, 40 minutes before they get around to saying what's really going on. So these folks have to be really well trained on what to listen for. So that our, our model is to only work with a pool of certified trained folks in this form of intervention so they know how to work it. Mm -hmm. So somebody would um, change the call forwarding to different numbers? Oh yeah, you can pre-program that according to a schedule. Like at 8.01, it automatically shifts to so-and-so's number. At, so somebody yeah. can just schedule it all at once? Yes, yeah. So you have someone who manages that. Okay, good, thank we do, you. Behavioral Health Network does a similar after hours uh, call service with uh, mm -hmm. the Northwestern District Attorney's Office. Same thing, there are several people who are trained in, on the survivor side and it's for a police intervention enhanced service. And when the clock changes, the phone, automat someone else's phone are, uh, automatically rings, so. Got it. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? Okay. So I would just um, ask, uh, I would just ask uh, you to consider participating in what's really an innovation. We would like not to have these kinds of interventions not be tied to a criminal justice service but to have a truly equity-based uh, community intervention that's about building relationships for safety. Um, isolation increases lethality, and so isolation orders are very dangerous. And so we, we want to be part of thinking out of the box, and so we, we would like you to be part of that. So thank you for hearing me out and um behalf of monica we hope you'll take this into consideration thanks for your time okay nate on to is sure. kevin still with us yeah kevin is still here so i'll um i'll make him a panelist Kevin. Um, all right, Kevin, you should, um, you're a panelist now. You can unmute yourself and speak to your proposal. 
I can actually try pulling it up too while we're um, Okay, there we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, good. You all set, Nate? Yeah, I was just going to pull up your... Um, you okay. See you, but you're sideways. What's this? Oh, I'm sideways. Oh, yeah, yeah that happens sometimes. That's okay. 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 Well, we do up. we do have kind of a funky uh, internet connection here. So if that's okay, I'll turn the video off now that you. Yeah, if you got you, you're you're vertical now. Okay. Yeah, no, but that's not the problem. It's just that the internet comes and goes. So I'll, now that we've had a chance to meet, I'll switch it in the video. Can you see a, a picture of me now? Yeah. Yeah, with a mask and a dog. <laughs> yes, that's my dog Elton. He goes everywhere with me. So thank you for the opportunity. Sorry about the mix up. I, I don't know what happened, but uh, I guess we ended up in some spam folder. Yeah, you ended up in like my, my, I had like two junk folders and you were like in my high alert uh, spam folder. What I'm does that mean? High alert. I'm not sure why. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so Craig Stores, as you know, was founded with a mission to provide safe, caring shelter for people who are experiencing homelessness. And, uh, while they're working to while we work to help them get housing and uh, we operate a seasonal shelter which closed on may 3rd but we keep the resource center open year-round and uh, we've just recently entered into a collaboration with uh, the amherst survival center to serve lunch to people here at the resource center uh, on the four days when they are open and they're doing great work up there but the, with this intense uh, uh, focus on putting more food out, it, it, it's, there's a conf conflict in terms of space. So we're going to try and pick up food from them and bring it down to the resource center and serve, uh, serve it to people who are homeless here. But one of the things that we lack as an organization is, is the ability to do case management and housing search. We do rely on our collaborations with, with organizations like Amherst Community Connections as well. But so many of our people have no income and they're not able to uh, afford themselves of the opportunities that are available through those programs. Uh, the CPA program that I think that ACC offers does require some income in order to participate. So we have to get creative and find ways to house people that are not traditional. Uh, we've been, since the shelter closed, chasing people out into the woods. Well, not chasing them out into the woods, chasing people in the woods, trying to make sure they have tarps and sleeping bags and and uh, uh, tents and everything they need to survive. There's one case that we were working with a, a young couple that they're, they're living in the woods and she's pregnant and uh, uh, you know, we're trying to get her into emergency shelter. So, but there's a need for case management, which we have not um, traditionally had any funding for. So one of the questions I had actually for you, Nate, is there, you mentioned at the top of the program here that there was some interest in spending this money quickly so uh, is it possible that we should shorten the, the time frame we, we put in for a year uh, of funding, but uh, is it possible that we can uh, uh, shorten it? Is, is that the preference of the committee? Well, no, I mean, some of it was um, DHCD had said that on a call, but they, a year is, could be fine, but DHCD really wants to know that the program is in response to impacts from COVID. So, you know, well, is, yeah, all right. you know, is, so is the, is the resource center, you know, is the need for this case management and housing stabilization, is this because of COVID or is this, is this just an extension of what you want to do anyway? So, I mean, the case has to be, no, made no, yeah. because of COVID. no, this is definitely in response to COVID because, uh, you know, the size of the first Baptist church isn't going to grow the, five, the size that it's, a, that is available to us is limited to the undercroft of the church and, you know, a conference room where the women stay, that's not going to get any bigger over the summer. So the 28 people that we served there uh, probably aren't going to fit in. And uh, we're going to have to have more space between them is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to reduce the number over the summer and through the fall, we're trying to reduce the number of people who are there who need that service during the winter. So yes, this is definitely, I mean, we're living in a post COVID world. Almost everything we do is now related to COVID-19, all our interactions, you know, it's, it's a strange new world that we're living in. And these are uncharted waters as we, as we, as everyone says, you know, so uh, we're trying to make sure that we have the ability to get as many people housed before the winter cold comes back to New England 
and uh, and put and, and thereby reduce the uh, the need for shelter. So it's it's definitely related to COVID nineteen. So, uh, but the the reason I was asking about that uh, timeline is that it certainly would be possible for us to make a six month proposal if that's the preference of the committee. That's all I was asking about. You know, the, the unemployment figures are, are going to be higher uh, due to COVID-19. And when the governor's moratorium on, on evictions expires, there's going to be even more homeless people. So we're trying to do what we can to remediate that crisis that's definitely on the horizon and, and reduce the need uh, for, for, you know, congregate shelter. Congregate shelter is in the age of COVID-19 is sort of uh, something that might almost be a thing of the past. Uh, you know, it's just going to be very difficult because, you know, we were fortunate and blessed, really. We didn't have a single positive case. And I wish I could tell you it's because of our great work and our hard work. We, 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 we squeezed those bleach bottles till our hands cramped, you know, and we, we, uh, we made sure people kept adequate social distance. But, you know, I think the virus just hadn't reached our region in, a, in the ways that, that it had in, say, New York or Boston or even Pittsfield. Uh, that's not likely to be the case going forward. We're likely to see, to see it creep into the people, into the community of people who are homeless. And, you know, they don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily engage in social distancing when, when we're not sort of around to help them, you know, and uh, uh, I've personally seen people who are homeless sharing cigarettes or, or, or drink or something, you know, it's, it, when and if it comes to their community, uh, just as we've seen in recent days with the eight diagnosed at the uh, Hamden County House of Correction, I think there's going to be a, a massive problem. And so we're trying to get people housed so that they have, they can maintain that distance. You know, there's, there's a group of them living off University Drive that's that's uh, you know uh, another thing that we would do is try to help them maintain sanitation and and get clean water and, and hopefully get permission to put a porta potty on that site. We're just worried that if they're going to live in tents, that's you know I think I used the term in a letter I wrote recently to the um, to the Amherst Bulletin. They melted into the woods, but they didn't go away. We know where they are, and, and this is very difficult for them to, in this COVID nineteen world, to uh, to be able to to cope and stay healthy uh, without the access to clean water and and, and uh, hand washing and, and and good food. So we're re we're really delighted that the survival center has teamed up with us. Uh, we've done some made up testing already. We've had about eight people over for lunch already. The JCA has also given us some money. To buy food from local Amherst businesses, so that it was like two birds with one stone. We uh, we helped the people who are homeless, and at the same time, they've directed us to help specifically Amherst restaurants, not chain not chain restaurants, but specific Amherst restaurants. So uh, that's what we're up against, and that's what we're looking for. Uh, I realized, you know, being able to, sitting through this meeting, I've been able to total the total. I mean, you have more request than you do money. So that's what I'm saying. If it's if a six month proposal is more acceptable to the committee, then we could certainly make an adjustment. We're we're just needing to get the job underway. And that's what our, our main concern is. I'm hoping I still have you guys here because I don't hear anything. Uh, Gail, you're muted. Okay. All the committee members are muted somehow. I'm sorry, my dog was barking. Um, <laughs> My dog is in a picture. He doesn't bark when he's sitting there. Um, yeah. Kevin, I apologize. You know, we just got this proposal and the budget, so we haven't had much time to mull it over. So questions will be based on what you've just shared with us. So we might come back sure. and have additional questions once we have time to. And I'd be happy to come back. Yes, thank you for the proposal and the budget. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody have questions? Okay. All right, thank you. So um, anybody else left in the green room or the waiting room or the panel room or wherever they're waiting, Nate? Looks like um, John Hornick has raised his cha uh, hand. Okay. I'll, um, I'll... As long as he's hey, not raising his chair. Hey, John, you're uh, allowed to talk now. Yeah, yeah you can, yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I will try to be brief given I know that the hour is late for you all. 
Um, clearly things are bad out there. I am not here to ask for funding, but ask for funding to complement work that the Amherst Municipal Housing Trust is already working on. Um, we just uh, uh, put out a request for quotations for an emergency rental assistance program. One of the things that a few other speakers have talked about is the fact that uh, there has been a temporary moratorium on evictions, um, but we are all concerned that that's going to go away in the not too distant future. And so the reason for an emergency rental assistance program is to assist families on paying future rent or perhaps paying arrears on rent that they currently owe. The Housing Trust committed $250,000 to this program. Uh, depending upon the nature of applications, we expect to be able to serve 60 to 80 families for at least three months. We hope that additional funds might be available in the future. Can you just the state the amount again, please? Sorry? Can you state the amount again, please? $250,000. Thank you. The source of the funds are Community Preservation Act. What that means is that they only go for rental assistance. There are no supportive services that can be provided with those dollars to the families that we serve. With a program like this, you would think that that would be um, a critical part of what we want to do. But unfortunately, um, as I said, the nature of what we're doing or the nature of funding source we're relying on prevents us from doing that. We view the CARES Act as an important opportunity for us, for the town, to be able to provide those complementary support services to families and to individuals. The way we've designed our program, uh, the priority is to families to the extent that homelessness can result from eviction, the last people we want to see thrown onto the street are families. So we've said at least 70% of the available funds would go to families, but some will go to individuals as well. So we're, what we're looking for is an organization that you can fund that will provide support services, critical support services, to families and to individuals who are at risk of eviction. There are at least two proposals, and we had uh, kind of brief descriptions of them that were presented at the last meeting of the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust. And we voted unanimously to ask you to support both of those programs. And those would be the program from Family Outreach of Amherst and from Amherst Community Connections. Um, we think both of those would complement the uh, emergency rental assistance program that we are uh, currently looking for an administrator for and we'll probably be start put, putting out money in, in about a month or so. Um, I think both of those proposals are worthy um, on the other hand, I know that sometimes social service funding agencies have a tendency to say, well, let's give a little bit of money to everybody and uh, kind of split the difference. I think in this case, um, you would be better advised to look at the proposals for the organizations that are offering social services and uh, choose one and fully fund the best proposal. I mean, from my point of view, I think the strongest proposal is one that can assist people in going into housing court that uh, has uh, dual language Spanish speakers, because we know a lot of the families are um, Latino. Uh, I think those are some of the important things for you to look at as well as the track record of the program. So really 
My plea is that you fund at least one, if not both of these programs um, in order to allow us to have a compliment for the commitment, the investment that we've made in the emergency rental assistance program. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have questions for John? All right. Anybody else? Thank you for your time, John. Anybody else out there in the wings with their hand up? Nate? Uh, I don't see anyone at this time. Okay. So should we conclude this part of the meeting and take a five minute bathroom break and then or reconvene so we can stretch? Sure, we could say that, you know, um, oh, oh, it's like Wei Ling has raised her hand. Okay. Right, Wei Ling, you're allowed to talk. You know, unmute yourself. I don't see her in my... No, she's on. Um... Oh, she's... Right, you can... Talking's permitted. Hey, Wei Ling. You'll have to unmute yourself. Or... Got it. All right, I have okay. unmuted myself. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason I want to add another piece of information is this. Um, we are one of the four agencies, as I understand, have been invited by the town of Amherst, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust to submit a quote, a proposal for quotation. And uh, we are working hard uh, to complete that quote quotation. So our uh, operation philosophy has been you don't want just to provide support service. If there's no housing as part of the solution, the support service is really in vain. It's just a lot of talking, but doesn't really help people solve the problem. So our agency has had the wonderful support of the town since 2016, received three uh, housing related fundings. Two of them are for the housing first, and we are operating on the phase two, the housing first. And the other one is the current, just started this February, the rental subsidy program. So because of this combination of support service and housing, so we feel, we understand the complexity of the combination and the experience we have incorporated, learned in these past four years and the fact that we are submitting the quotation uh, RFQ. We, so we want to emphasize it. We are really in agreement with Mr. Hornick, the need to have support service. If you are going to help people pay their back rent, you have to know how to help them to get themselves back to the income producing stage, such as secu securing employment, such as dealing with other problems that will lead them to their decrease in income or lead them to have rent unpaid. So that's the type of support service that we are ready to do based on our track record. And in terms of helping people bilingual, bicultural, or housing court experience, we have helped people go into housing court advocating for them. And many times through landlord mediation, we really help families stay away from the housing court altogether, but work out the budget plan such that landlord is happy and the tenants are able to pay the rent without- Ooh, somebody left the cookie. Evicted. So that's the extra push uh, that I would like to add to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anybody else out there waiting to have their chance to speak? It's like uh, Claudia is I will, um Allow her to speak. Hi, Claudia. You can um, you can speak. Hi there. Can you see me? I don't know if you can see me. Uh, <laughs> I can't see you. <laughs> I can't. That's fine. Okay. I firstly, I just want to thank everyone. I want to thank Valley. I'm uh, going back to the original micro enterprise um, uh, proposal through Valley CDC partnership and CDBG funding. I just wanna thank uh, D. Dice for presenting tonight. I'm, I'm willing to partner with the town of Amherst. We know that the regional grant um, is a lot more attractive in this particular process. So I wanna thank her for um, presenting tonight. And I just wanna thank um, the chamber and the bid 
put in a letter together. And uh, what we did was we were, are supporting both the microenterprise portion of the CDBG application as well as the social services. You know, we feel strongly that there's a, if we can strike a chord and a balance of both, um, knowing that there was a common thread through all of the uh, testimony and, and um, applications tonight, which was unemployment, and you know, putting people back to work and supporting our local businesses will get people off these programs and back to work. So, uh, you know, so I really strongly um, support both, but um, we feel like the micro enterprise, again, is just to put our economy back on track as well as we can. And as she mentioned, Valley uh, D mentioned, one of the pieces is in our grant process, there were a, at least a dozen or so businesses that were left out in this process that would absolutely qualify under this program and we could easily reach out. And we said that we would be partners in reaching out to those businesses. I know there were questions earlier about how to reach those businesses and we've already had a lot of direct contact with them and we will continue both of it and Chamber have uh, committed to supporting the process to getting the word out along with the town. So we are happy to partner on this together to make that, that um, happen and to get the word out and um, but we know I mean this is just an extraordinary time the needs are great and they are in every corner there's no corner of this community that's untouched um, so I just want to again just support and reiterate what uh, Dee shared but also to clarify some points made so I hope that helps and thank you thank you Claudia thank you Okay, Nate, anybody else out there? I don't see anyone. All right, so should we take a 10 minute break and reconvene at like 6.15? Maybe, maybe just like about five and come five? back at okay. six ten. Sure. Okay. Is that, um, yeah, I'll, you know, the meeting will just stay, the meeting will stay running. Yes. Um, does just the committee have any comments about that or? Um... Uh, Nate, this is Keith, I have a hard stop at 6.45 for another Zoom meeting. Okay, so we could, um, so my thought would be, let's uh, take a few minutes, we can come back and discuss the proposals and if the committee, um, uh, you know, if, if we need more time, we could schedule a meeting uh, early next week if that's possible to resume the discussion since we do have a, a few extra days with the extension from DHCD. Okay. Yeah, and, just, and actually just on that point, one quick question. I mean, if yeah, given that the deadline has been extended, um, is, don't we need to, doesn't it make sense to meet later? Meet again. And meet again? Um, you know, unless we're going to keep hearing proposals, um, um, I mean, it's, that's up to the committee if you want to meet again. Um, Shall we, shall we see if, 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 if there's any um, if there are things that we need to discuss or if um, we need any follow up or if uh, I feel like I'm, you know, at this point without hearing views, anyone else's views, I feel like I'm pretty clear in my mind which direction I want to go, but I don't know about anyone else. Okay, hold on. Let's break for five minutes. <laughs> Come back. I really need a, a five minute break. All right. And to, right. to, but leave your computer on and running and I'll see you, we'll see each other in five. All right. Thanks everyone.
Now, are you doing the math? Well, what I came up with was including the Craig's doors and the update to literacy project and so forth. Um, the total ask is about 493,000. Yeah. I came up with a formula already, but I don't want to spill the beans yet. Pardon? I said, I came up with a formula for distribution, um, but I don't want to spill the beans so everybody's fat. All right, it looks like, um, hey everyone, I, I can make myself visible again since, you know. <laughs> so why do you, Nate, not, why are you invisible during the call? Oh, well, I think the, um, you know, I just want to give the um, screen to the presenters. I see. And I've heard, I don't know if it's true, if you're, if the bandwidth is bad, if people um, stop the video, it works better, but. Um, the moderator, you mean? If the moderator stop? Yeah, if, if like everyone turns the video off and sometimes the call goes, the meetings go better, but I, I'm not sure if that's true or not. Okay. All right. So um, we have uh, discussed and review comments from public hearing as the next item under the public meeting portion of our agenda. So does, should we go around and see if anybody has, but can I just clarify, we can give to, we're not limited to the number of agencies like we are during our normal work here. Right, so this is, um, this money is gonna be um, uh, appended to our 19 grant. So DHCD took this money and folded it in to the 2019 grants, which ours, you know, is actually gonna, would be wrapping up uh, this summer. So we'll just, we end up having to do like an extension. It'll be, you know, like a, um, an amendment to our 19 grant, but um, the COVID funding doesn't have any, um, any restrictions on the number of uh, social services that are funded, right? So we could fund as many. I think DHCD really does want to look at though um, agencies or programs that are um, addressing impacts from COVID. So, you know, they've said that a lot, um, you know, and we have to justify that as a local need. Um, I think before we begin though, Keith, I know you have to leave. If committee members aren't sure we can finish tonight, I mean, would we want to just set a date next week um, we're starting to pull up a calendar just so we could, you know, we could, we could discuss, we could um, um, have a date um, certain that we could meet again. Instead of doing some of it now, just rescheduling. No, no, we, can, we, we, we have the discussion now, but if, for instance, Keith needs to leave in, um, in half an hour. If we can't finish in half an hour and we've just received Craig's doors, um, would we want to meet again, say like on June 1st or June 2nd? Um, and is would it be early afternoon or evening or what? It seemed like early after, um, you know, around three or four works better for committee members. It's really up to you. Um, Do you want to propose next Tuesday at four? Because I don't think we would need as long as we have today because this is just the committee meeting. We're not having comments from right. agencies. So Tuesday the second at four. Yep, that's fine with me. Anybody else? Keith and Andrew? Andrew? Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm looking. Okay. I work with preschoolers on Zoom and we say, if you can hear me, touch your nose. So Tuesday at four is good, touch your nose. <laughs> yep, no, that's fine. So I just have a, so the extension was until June 12th. Am I remembering that right? Yes. Yes. So that means that if we meet on Tuesday and get proposals after that, we would need to need to meet again. Well, I think the idea would be we, um, you know, we have we set a deadline to receive proposals. We could ask for if we want to get more proposals in, but at some point we have to stop. You know, we can't keep receiving proposals. Um, and so it's up to the, you know, if the committee wants to still keep it open a little bit. Um, so. So I'm sorry. So what is the what is the June twelfth ex, uh, extension then? If it's not one we need to observe, I'm, I'm not I'm not understanding. No, I think I think what it was is I think DHCD heard from a number of communities that they actually couldn't do this process by June fifth. So for instance, you know the um, sometimes in the summer, smaller communities, there's their board of selectmen or select boards doesn't meet, so they couldn't get a signature to apply or 
they didn't have enough time to have agencies submit proposals. And, um, you know, I think we've, we've had a, a pretty good turnout. Um, you know, we were able to get the word out, but if we wanted to continue the, um, receiving proposals is up to the committee. If we think we can have a few extra days, I see. um, I see. you know, I think that's, I think that was really the reason I think DHD felt, you know, was, was, um, they want, they wanted to get moving quickly. So they put June 5th and then they found out from a lot of communities that it was too quick. <laughs> right. So June 5th and June 12th are not proposal deadlines. Those are for the entire process. Right. That's when the town, okay. all towns have to submit okay. their applications to DHCD. I see. So it was going to be June 5th, but now it's June 12th. Okay. So basically once we finish our work, then, um, Nate, you'd be the one that would have to put everything together in the form that goes to the state by that deadline. Right, right. So I'd work with the town manager's office to, you know, like a normal process, finalize the recommendations and then um, submit to um, the state. So it, how do we feel about going out and soliciting more proposals or? or I mean, right, saying that if we're meeting again on June 2nd, uh, if that works, you know, would we allow proposals to be submitted for the, another day or two, for instance? I think we already had one deadline and we had lots of proposals that's well over the amount of funding we have available. I'm not sure how, what committee members feel about that. Before we answer that though, can we answer, does June 2nd at four work just in case we need that time? It looks like we might. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Does that work for you? You walked away. For me. All right. Yes. Okay, just see at four. All right. Touch my nose. Touch your nose. <laughs> um, but that's a tough question. Do we go out and solicit more? I mean, there's a, a, a nice array of agencies doing mm -hmm. all doing COVID related work that feels very necessary. And I mean, I think the wonderful part about this is that we don't have to limit it. We can give to as many agencies as we want which is always such a conundrum when we're in a formal process. How long does it, has the uh, people had to respond and get a proposal in? Do you have any idea in it, uh, Ms. Adrian? Well, we, you know, we, you know, they, you know, they, I think they turned this around in um, you know, like a week, a week and a half or something, or, you know, so it wasn't a long time to, um, I'd have to look exactly when they were when we put it out there, but it wasn't you know it wasn't very long, mm -hmm. and um, so I think that's what communities were saying. You know how how do you apply to DCD with a program proposal if you don't even have time to talk to an agency to get a program together? You know we're fortunate enough that we have programs that are you know up and running and have capacity and have the ability to do that. Some may not, so there still may be programs who are looking. Mm -hmm. I think you know I've heard that there may be a second round of funding that comes through. Um, that's one. The other one is our 2020 grant, which we're, um, you know, would receive in the fall. DHCD is anticipating allowing communities to amend those grants as well. So we haven't, I haven't heard about those changes yet, but perhaps they might allow communities to fund more than five social services, for instance, in your 20 grant, which hasn't happened yet, but there may be a possibility. So, you know, I'm just saying that there, you know, there's probably maybe two more chances to um, allocate funding to this if it, you know, I can't say for certain that it's, that it'll happen, but that's what I'm hearing. I would, I would support extending, I would support soliciting some more. You know, I think it's not surprising that the ones who have um, applied are Nate, as you say, the ones who are sort of used to our process mm -hmm. and maybe have capacity to do that. That is a very short amount of time at a time when lots of people Maybe the people who, you know, are among those who most need the support are incredibly busy. Did we, did you reach out to any of the people that did apply directly or, or did everybody get a... The notice went out, you know, I sent it to past recipients in the past, you know, a few years, you know, went up to Amherst Human Service Network, to COSA, um, um, you know, was in the, um, you know, a few different media outlet so you know I, d I did the the typical outreach i mean i you know i 
uh, as we've discussed before, I, you know, I send it to who I know, but there may be organizations or agencies I don't know. So it's hard to say, you know, did everyone who needs this funding <clears throat> know about it, um, given it, it was a short window. Would you, would you put something else out? So, you know, if, we ex if we're able to take more proposals, we should put a notice somewhere, I would think. Yeah, no, I could, I could um, put it again on the town website and do some more emails and um, you know, try to advertise it again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would think that, you know, accepting more would be uh, make, just to make sure we haven't missed something. Yeah, you know, because it is such a short period of time. But as Nat said, we already have, you know, four, almost $492,000 worth of asks right now, and we can only get 400000 so we don't want to, I don't want to say shoot ourselves in the foot, but, you know, then it, the, pool, the piece of the pie gets smaller and smaller and smaller as more agencies apply, if we decide to pull it to mm -hmm. everybody. I just want to try to be fair to people so that everybody that wanted to apply knows about it and can. Yeah. So now, if Nate, if you extend it, it would. And should we, if we decide to get the word out in the community that we're still accepting proposals, meeting on Tuesday really wouldn't do much good because by the time you get the information out, people need time to process. So maybe we should. I'm looking at a calendar. Maybe we should just push this up a whole week so organizations have at least a week to get their proposal together so if we met the week of the 8th or because people need a week if we met like the, on the 8th then we could make our final decision that day because that's because meeting next week doesn't do much good if we're going to take in more proposals right we'd have to do if it's a public hearing if we're wanting if we need presentations we have to have a five-day notice requirement yeah well, and how much time do you need nate at the end well, we'll need a few days. I mean, I think if we're going to, you know, if we push it instead of the second, if we meet on the fourth, you know, I don't really care. I mean, if we meet on the fifth of the Friday, I mean, that gives us plenty of time to advertise another hearing. You know, we consider this, this um, second meeting also, you know, be a hearing and then a meeting. Um, and that gives me enough time, you know, because it is up to the town manager. So, you know, there may be some discussion with the town manager and staff and then, you know, the DCD expects, you know, a cover letter and then a kind of a, a package proposal. It's nice that we're, we're getting the, those activity proposals from agencies, but we'll have to refine, I think, those a little bit and then um, come up with, a, you know, an application. Yeah, so, I guess you know, I think my, my, my concern is that, um, you know, even if we do keep it open, there won't be new you know, channels, so it won't necessarily reach anybody new, and it just kind of pushes everything back and puts more and more pressure on Nate, you know, the town and town manager to put the package together. Sure. Well, so, so, but that gets into the, the question of how much time does Nate need, right? So certainly we should leave Nate the time he needs, and then I think the, the, whole avenue of distribution thing is less about reaching more people and more about giving the few people who actually may need more time. And then it looks like Lev has her hand raised if you want to recognize her Gail an hour in a minute. Um, um, sure, <laughs> Lev, go ahead. Sure, Lev, I'll allow you to talk. You can, you should be all set to unmute yourself. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, thanks for taking this. I know this is the committee section. Um, I would like to just respond by um, clearly it's the committee's decision in terms of seeking new proposals. Um, however, I just want to express that as an applicant, um, there's a a part of that that feels challenging. Um, there's a CDBG expectation around a public hearing process. Um, and by adding additional public hearings, that is um, adding additional time that would also make sense for these organizations on frontline, doing frontline work to be present for. Um, and I guess from my perspective, hearing the thoughtful 
presentations of multiple organizations today. There's uh, capacity represented here, um, not people who are sitting around waiting to write grant proposals, but folks who are answering the phones all day long, dealing with new processes, ramping up programs, et cetera. So I would just really encourage the committee to think about the um, enormous capacity of multiple organizations who presented today and who um, made the best effort to put proposals together in a very short time frame. Um, it was a week that include exactly one week that included a holiday weekend. So I would just encourage the committee to um, con consider the, the impact on applicants. Thank you, Lev. So, Nate, I have to just ask you if we hypothetically, we have two camps, we can go out and extend the time for proposals to come in, or we, we can't, we can say we're not, and we can begin deliberating when we meet again. Is it detrimental to the committee's um, position in the community if we don't go out and allow time for more proposals? Um, I don't. Is it a have to? I guess, is it a have to? Do we have to do it or uh, is it up to us? I don't think it's a have to. I think it's the committee can discuss it. Um, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I think that, um, you know, we had a process that was quite abbreviated, um, but we were able to generate some, some proposal activities. You know, um, you know, like Paul and Andrew said, though, did the word get out there enough? It was a short week with the holiday. So did, you know, was there, you know, did it not get out there broadly enough uh, in the time frame? I know it was, you know, you know, what Lev is saying it is, it was, a, it was a hardship for people to put something together so quickly um, because they were doing other, you know, they were, they were working as well. The, um, so, you know, I, I think it's at the discretion of the committee. I don't, you know, I think if we were to hold another meeting or hearing next week, it gives the town time to, um, you know, to, to get an application together um, you know, I don't, you know, I, I, so for instance, we had decisions by next Friday by, um, I had a calendar, but, you know, for instance, if we knew by, um, by June 5th, what we needed, what are the recommendations were, that gives me a week to put together something with the town manager's office and that's fine. But it doesn't give organizations much time to get it. If you put out a notification tomorrow and they've got to turn around and get it to us in a couple of days. Does that feel workable for agencies? Um, good question. So, yeah. Hmm. Anybody want to jump in? I think Andrew's spoken in favor of extending it. I've spoken uh, in favor of cutting it off at this point. So I don't know if other committee members have other thoughts. Uh, I'd favor extending it. All right. Like Mindy Dom also has her hand raised. Gail, if you want to recognize her. Uh, sure. Mindy? Right, Mindy. You're allowed to talk, Mindy. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to intrude in this part of the meeting. I've been a fly on the wall, not really, because you knew I was here, but I'm um, just listening because I've been following and tracking this money through the state back to the town. Um, with excitement, actually, because it's the rare time that, that federal funds related to COVID is actually being designated for a local use. Um, as you know, right now, there's discussion and disagreement in, the, in Congress as to whether or not the Fed should be funding local services. But this particular CARES money um, was designated for a community development block grant with the great help of our state, of our U.S. Senators, Markey and Warren. And they did it because they knew that there were COVID-related basic needs issues that were surfacing and emerging that needed to be tended to right away. And so they created this, I, I, Nate can speak to it, I think it's unprecedented um, way to use community development block grant funds to meet basic needs that were being that we were seeing as a result of COVID-19. And the previous speaker is correct. This money is specific for what is happening on the ground in our town as a result of COVID-19. 
Um, Nate mentioned earlier that there will be probably an opportunity for the committee and for other towns in Massachusetts to reprogram money that they might have designated for the next fiscal year if COVID-19 impacts would impact those decisions. So there'll be an opportunity to revisit that if you wanted to. I think there's also gonna be an opportunity to do next year's community development block grant. But you should know that every town is facing the same time frame in terms of spending, getting this money from the feds and spending it um, on needs as they exist in the present day, not needs for you know months from now, but needs from now through um, the next couple of months. So I just want to reassure you that you're not facing a time frame that's different from other towns. Um, I'm impressed that organizations that are um, providing everyday services in incredible amounts, in unprecedented amounts to people in our town, had it together to be able to pull together these quite significant um, grant applications. And I don't know if it's true, but it's quite possible that other organizations that might have considered it might have self excluded themselves knowing that this is community development block grant money specific to emerging COVID-19 related needs in the present day. So I just wanted to reassure you that this is a time frame that towns throughout the Commonwealth are dealing with. Um, it's a special federal program. Um, and it's great that we have organizations in town that are providing these services and that can demonstrate and document it so that we can, you can make a quick decision if you need to. So thank you for letting me have my say. Thank you, Andy. Um, so did Keith have, um, Keith, did you weigh in as to whether we should uh, open up the timeline up for more proposals or not? That sounds great. Right. Okay. Oh, he's unmuted. Maybe he's a. Uh... Did you hear me? No. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Did, uh, Keith, do you want to weigh in on whether you think we should, you know, open up for more proposals or not? We should not. Okay. So you think we shouldn't. Nat thinks we shouldn't. Paul thinks we should. Keith thinks we should. And I'm the tiebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we should, and I. But I think we have to keep our timeline tight. So if you have to have a recommend, you know, twelve. The twelfth is the deadline that you have to have. We have to have the recommendation. Is that it? The twelfth is the recommendation that we give to you, or you, and or you communicate it to the town manager. No, the twelfth is a day we have to submit it to the state. Okay. So that's the day that I, it has to be submitted at the very latest. Okay, so if we if you put something out today's Wednesday, if you put something out Thursday, folks would have you know barely a week to turn it around, but at least it feels like we're doing what we should be doing. Um, and we met again on Thursday the fourth, and then that would be to hear for a public hearing and then to make final recommendations. Would that work for people? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And can I ask about the public hearing aspect? Um, so we spent two hours today with public hearing and no time for the committee um, process. Can we, you know, make sure that doesn't happen on the fourth or how, how would that work? Yeah, I think um, Nat, I'll just jump in. I think we can, um, you know, I think the, for those still listening, we can let the people know that the, who's the, the agencies that have already presented don't need to present again. Right. And so it'd be for new information or if the committee, you know, if, if members email me individually and have some, you know, a really big question about one of the proposals, we can, uh, I can let the applicants, you know, know and they could respond. But, um, you know, my thought would be we don't necessarily need to hear from the same agencies again. I think it has to be exclusive to new, new, newly received proposals, yeah. um, just for the sake of time. All right, so if we're saying, say, Thursday, June 4th at 4. So touch your nose if that works for you. <laughs> <laughs> works Keith, for, Keith for, it works for four year old. <laughs> Wait, Keith, Keith, Keith has to say something because we can't see him. Okay, it's, it's Thursday, June 4th at 4 for a public hearing to accept um, 
proposed, will be taking in, will have received the proposals hopefully at least a day before to read them through. Mm -hmm. And then folks will be able to present only exclusively for um, new proposals submitted between now and whatever deadline you're giving me. Mm -hmm. yeah. The, um, yeah, Matt, Keith, you have to, it looks like you probably have to leave in about 10 minutes. So it looks like Gail, Ted Parker ha has raised his hand, but so the committee likes that plan. I just want to make sure that that sounds good. Well, June 4th at four and I can, you know, it'll be the same, you know, it'll be the same notices and similar postings that went out for today. Okay. Yeah, no, that sounds fine. I also need to leave in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. And um, do we want to hear from Ted before Keith and Andrew sign off? Sure. Oh, Ted, you're allowed to speak. Oh, I, I, I think the process that you just, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I think the process that you just approved creates like inequity in it, in that you're allowed, you're, you're basically saying some folks who will have, you know, more time to present at, an, at a hearing than others. Uh, I think that if you want to create an equitable process, then you have to allow those who have already applied the extra time to revisit their proposals that were put together in the original timeline and and if they want to amend them, that they should have the right to represent those proposals. Otherwise, you're creating a two-tier system where some people had an extra week to, to think about what they wanted to do. Can I respond to that? May I respond? Sure. I, I, I think that folks, if they had wanted to respond by today, would have. Um, I don't think that they were mulling over, uh, perhaps or anticipating that the deadline would be extended. So to me, in my eyes, it doesn't feel like there's mm -hmm. equitable. Um, I just think that it, it, we're trying to cast a wider net and allow for those agencies who just didn't know about this, have an opportunity to um, submit a proposal. Nate, would you like to weigh in? Oh, Paul's got his hand up. <clears throat> and I think that the flip side is exactly the same as Ted, you know, is you're pointing out and that people didn't hear, may not have heard about it. And then once, if we didn't do a second round, they would say that they weren't given a fair chance and could complain about that. So, I mean, I think it was short, a short time. Um, if there's some amendment, I don't know why we couldn't let that happen if people wanted to add to what they've said. Um, but I think to be fair, everybody it would because it was such short notice we should uh, extend it that's all thank you all right um we're losing keith in eight minutes and we're losing andrew shortly as well yeah, i think um paul your point um yeah we can i can send a notice out saying that those who submitted can also always amend proposals and then you know i think we'd have to be um the committee, we'd have to run a pretty efficient meeting on the fourth. So, mm -hmm. you know, well, to, we're going to meet at four, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So we'll have more time. Or we could. You want to bump it up to three, so we have plenty of time. That's up to the committee members. It might be worth just in case. Anybody? Is three would three work for everybody else? So can I touch your ear? Three works for you. Three. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to move the June 4th meeting up to three o'clock. And I think what, um, but, but we also know that organizations had three pages to submit. So we're not looking for additional materials to, I think it's a, a revised meet, but we're not looking for any additional materials, right? Right, right. Yeah, so right, they revise. I mean, you know, I agree. I mean, this was a short time frame, so people may have put in a budget that, they would like to revisit a little bit more, for instance, just, um, you know, or, you know, maybe the program doesn't necessarily change what details do. So I think if, yeah, if, if they, if you want to revise proposals, they have that ability. Okay. Does that sound fair to uh, committee members? Okay. All right. Anything else um, on our agenda? We're just buried on the um, public comment, we've had other items not anticipated within 48 hours. So we're all agreement, in agreement that our next meeting is June 4th at 3 p.m.
to hear from new applicants as well as receive revised proposals from current applicants <laughs> with a plan to have sufficient time to meet and discuss the proposals and make a recommendation. Okay. All right, that's it. The meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good to Thanks. see you all. Thank you. And Bye for now. Good Thanks seeing everyone. you all again. See you in a week and a half. Okay. Right. Thanks, Bye -bye. Be well. Let's see how we shut it off now. Okay, there we go. Wow. Let's see here.